again, my name is Jason Pasling. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been, uh, like I said, in the healthcare field for about 20 years. I started when I was 18 working on an ambulance. And I did that till I went to nursing school. Went to nursing school. Uh, I was an ER nurse for 10 years, flight nurse on a helicopter. And then I went to nurse practitioner school. I worked in the emergency rooms. I worked at the hospital in interventional radiology doing procedures. And then in January of 2016, I uh, got asked by our medical director, Dr. Khan, Omar Khan, to join the palliative care team. And that was a very honor. I was very honored and I'm truly grateful to be a part of that team. And I'll tell you a little bit about it here in just a second. Okay, so here's our team. Uh, again, Omar Khan, he is our medical director and he actually started the program. He is a board certified palliative care uh, and hospice uh, physician. Uh, Nancy Dahlberg, who's in the back, wave Nancy. That's Nancy, Nancy's our uh, clinical liaison director. She was our administrative director, but <sighs> She had to do something else, and so she, we're going to miss her, but she is still our clinical liaison. Catherine Foster, oops, sorry, Catherine Foster, she, we have a social worker and a licensed therapist as part of our team. Uh, there's me, uh, I'm a nurse practitioner, I'm also a board certified. Uh, what those letters mean, I'm a hospice and palliative care nurse practitioner. And then Colleen Strand, she's our latest addition, she is also a nurse practitioner and she'll be taking her boards very soon as well. So that's who we are. And so where do we work? We work at the hospital, at Cadillac. We are part of the uh, uh, medical associate team there at the hospital. We uh, work on all the floors. We participate in uh, many different uh, departments, activities, but our central focus is palliative care, which I will get to in a second. But we also see patients as an outpatient, pa patients receiving palliative care at and currently we're at the Tri-Cities Cancer Center and we'll be opening up our own brand new clinic. Right now we share space with the Hematology Oncology Clinic but we're getting our own space in February? February. So it was January but it looks like it's gonna be February, lots of logistics, but we're getting there. So that's currently kind of what we do there. Now, let's get to the meat and bones of what we're gonna talk about today. Palliate. That's a big word. You hear palliative, palliate, it's not really thrown around very much, but what does it mean? And this is, to very simply put it, to relieve or lessen without curing, to mitigate. The actual word palliate comes from a Latin word that means to cloak or cover. And so, that's what we want to do. We want to try and lessen, slow down, mitigate, what have you. So. What is palliative care? Now, I forgive you if you can't read this. There's, I know I try to get the writing as big as I could to keep it on a slide, but essentially, it's medical care for people with serious illness. Now, when we talk about serious illness, we're talking about chronic, can be life-limiting illness, but illnesses that can cause symptoms. But the other part of this is, is uh, illness that the treatment for it can also cause distressing symptoms. So, we want to provide relief, from the symptoms of a stress of a serious illness, the goal is to improve quality of life. And that is the huge part right there, quality of life. When you hear those words, what I want you to think of is, what can I do to spend quality time with my family, my friends, do the things that I want to do within reason? You know, you know, I can't go out and climb Mount Everest maybe, but you can get out there and you know, do the things you want to enjoy as much as you can. So we want to provide that quality of life. Now, palliative care can be provided by doctors, Advanced practice providers like myself, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, there's nurses, social workers, chaplains, there's a whole village of people that provide palliative care services. Uh, it's appropriate at any age, so we're talking birth, pre-birth even, if you we can get into that, also through, you know, through the lifespan. Uh, any stage, any serious illness can provide along with curative treatment as well, so we're going to get to that here in a second and talk about it. But let's talk about a little bit of history. Everybody hears the word hospice, right? Everybody, has everybody heard that word hospice? Okay, so all of this palliative care and hospice care kind of started with the same movement, and it actually uh, started back, in, well, originally hospice started in 67, but kind of go back even more historically, hospices were originally places of rest, let's keep that in mind, rest for travelers in the fourth century, so that's what I, the word hospice came from, a place of rest. In the 19th century, there's a religious order that was established hospices, places of rest, for people that were dying. In 1967, this nice lady right here, her name is Dame Cicely Saunders, she established the first hospice. 
The one thing that's very historical about hospice is the word death, dying. Very taboo. Before, you didn't talk about it. You didn't address it. Somebody that was dying, it's like, okay, they're just dying. You don't, you don't keep that down there. You don't bring it up. You're not talking about their feelings, what they're feeling when they're dying. It was a very taboo subject to even bring up with your patients when you're into the doctor's office. But the big question is, how many of us here are going to die? <laughs> I am. I, I admit it. You know, and that's the thing. Is it's like it's not a dirty word. It's not a bad word. It's it's a time. It's a cycle of life. We're born and we die. It's it's nobody's inevitable except Superman, of course. But hey, you know. But uh, you know, everybody's going to die. And the thing is, we need we needed to talk about it because we want to make sure that people have. And this is the way I've, I heard this from one of, one of my favorite hospice nurses to this day. And she said, we want to make sure that people have a smooth landing. And that's about the nicest way I've ever heard that put before. So this is what she wanted to do. She wanted to ask people. She said, you know, what are you feeling right now? What is going through your mind? What fears do you have? You know, so forth. And so she really started addressing this. So it was starting in the United Kingdom. And so the hospice movie kind of started growing after that. In the 60s, you, I don't know how many have heard of the stages of dying, you know, ang, you know denial, anger. So, so a young lady named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was actually a psycho, psychologist, developed uh, or wrote a book called On Death and Dying where they address these things. So that was another kind of uh, motivator to start this movement, talking about death and dying. She did that too. She stepped out of that taboo world and started talking to people that were dying that were at the end of their life, asking them what they were feeling, what were they going through. So she was very instrumental in that. So in the 70s, uh, in Canada, they, uh, they coined the actual term palliative care, which meant it was uh, to treat symptoms, symptom management. And they started it in teaching hospitals, and they, what they were addressing is there's different types of distress that people have. There's physical, Psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual distress. All of these things contribute to someone having distress about what's going on with them, with their illness. In 1985, the United States started its first palliative care consult service. Now, consult service is like when you go to the hospital and say you need to see somebody about your kidneys. Well, they would consult a kidney doctor or a nephrologist. So it's kind of like part of it. So if you, every day we have a list at the hospital of the different specialties that are on call for consults. Well, what they're talking about here is palliative care got added to that list at that time, which had never happened. So it started back in the 80s. The first palliative care medicine program started at the Cleveland Clinic in Cle uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland Clinic's pretty big. Has anybody heard of Cleveland Clinic before? It's, it's huge. It's like Mayo Clinic. I mean, it's really advanced. 1997. They did a Institute of Medicine, which is very big. They did a report about palliative care. They, the Institute of Medicine does a lot of funding and research for healthcare, and to have them start doing care about, you know, at the end of life was very big. And textbooks came out. Bill Moyers, who remembers Bill Moyers? I remember, I remember Bill Moyers. On our own terms, he did a series on that, and he's talking about people dying. Again, on their own terms, and lack of a better term, you know, they they're, were honoring their wishes. Palliative care for faculty scholars, clinical practice guidelines. I mean, all these things is like, okay, they're building up to this. I mean, they're, it's being, it's a real specialty. You know, we're we're actually going after and dis, and uh, working with people about palliative care. In 2006, 11 years ago. There were 57 palliative, medicine, palliative care medicine fellowship programs. Now, what's a fellowship program? Real quick, to let you know, whenever a provider, a doctor, goes to medical school, he gets out, he goes into a residency program. Whether it be family medicine, internal medicine, what have you, surgery, what have you. Then, afterwards, they do what's called a fellowship, which is kind of like a post-residency education. So the doctors would go through like an internal medicine or a family medicine program, and then they will get additional training in palliative care. And that's what a fellowship program is. Palliative care team, so here's, so that's about, that's the history, okay? So now, let's talk about what is palliative care and what do we address? So, we specialize in people and dealing with their symptoms. People with chronic long-term illnesses that can be life-limiting, 
but certainly can ca are causing a decreased quality of life. Okay, and that's the big thing. So patients such that have cancer, congestive heart failure, COPD, emphysema, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and there's lots more. This is just kind of a, a very sampling of it. And the two, the, the, the main symptoms that we're using, I, I mentioned this before, the main areas that we're addressing are physical, emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual. And I'm going to talk about these here in a second. But as I said before, the disease itself can cause symptoms, but treatment for the disease can also cause symptoms. So for example, cancer. Someone that has opted to receive chemotherapy, chemo, make you lose your hair, give you some nausea, make you feel weak, numbness, tingling fingers. I don't know if you know anybody or yourself as cancer have been through treatment. Maybe you under know this and you can understand that you can receive that. We want to address that. We want to deal with those symptoms. Anything's causing distress. So going into this pain, that is the most common symptom we deal with. These things, these disease processes can cause pain in different areas. There's different types of pain that people can experience. There's different ways to address the pain and that's where we come in as a specialty. I'm not saying that other doctors cannot address pain, but we kind of focus on it a little more. Our microscope's a little more tuned in to deal with that. We're not trying to cure the cancer. We're not trying to fix the kidneys. We're trying to deal with the symptoms. So that's where our specialty kind of comes into place. So can be caused by the disease or the treatment of the disease, like I was telling you. Different types of methods used to treat pain. Of course, we use medications. But there's other things that we can do other than medication. There's non pharmacologic things we can do. Physical therapy, massage, interventional pain management. That's using a specialty doctor to place medicine or do procedures to alleviate the pain. So there's a lot of different ways to address pain these days other than just a pill. Many of our patients do use medications and many times they're very strong medicines and that needs very close monitoring. It's a very high risk ordeal. I mean, how many of you have been watching the news about opiates or hearing about opiates? We use opiates quite frequently in our care of patients. So we have to be very careful, and they're much, they're many times they're using much higher dosing than the average person. So it's a very close relationship. It's a very mo you know, highly monitored uh, regimen that we have them on, so we need to be very careful. So it's something we spend a lot of time on to make sure we're doing the, you know, the right thing for them. And that's why I said down here, continuous monitoring and adjustment of the treatment regimen. We're seeing patients in the hospital, but when we see them as an outpatient, we're seeing them on a routine basis. It's not like, oh, I'll see you in six months. No, it's usually every two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, we're seeing them. How you doing? How you feeling? What's changed? Because many times we're making adjustments through all this. Okay, other physical symptoms, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, fatigue, decrease in appetite, sleep disturbances, skin changes, all these things are in the realm of physical symptoms that people deal with that cause them distress when they're dealing with a chronic illness. So we manage and we address all these. Now, emotional. When you're walking into your doctor's office to get that funny feeling checked out, or gosh, I've been feeling this bump here, or I'm more short of breath than I was, there's a lot of things going through your mind. It's scary. And fear is probably one of the biggest things that we encounter. And even in patients that are, have already been diagnosed, is it getting worse? Did my scan come out okay? What am I gonna feel with the symptoms? You know, what kind of symptoms am I gonna feel with the disease? What's the treatment gonna be? There's a lot of questions in their mind. So we can't forget to address that emotional aspect, that emotional piece that people are experiencing. And fear is very big. Disease reoccurrence, someone that has been treated for cancer and they've been cancer free for four years and all of a sudden they go in for their routine checkup, cancer's back. You know, very scary. Disease progression, I thought we had it under control. I thought we were getting better and now it's worse. How will this affect my family? If you're the breadwinner of your family and all of a sudden you've got this devastating disease diagnosis, it's gonna affect the way you provide for your family and, deal, and help your family. What symptoms will I experience? I mentioned that. Am I going to die? That is a huge question we get asked. I do not wanna die. Nobody wants to die. I, you know, that is the very biggest truth, but we all know we're going to, but 
gosh, I don't want to die right now. I've got so much to do in my life. I've got so many things to live for. You know, it's fear of provoking, you know, and then we have, then we're talking about the physical symptoms, but the emotional symptoms are so huge, huge. And it just, it, it's, it's as bad as the pain sometimes. Anxiety and depression. So many times we see this top one, top situational reactive depression. When you're told that you have cancer, clearly anxiety, depression are very central and can hit you hard. And it's not that you've had it before, but it's what's called situational or you're reacting to a diagnosis. This is something very common that we see. People that have depression or anxiety that precedes their new diagnosis can exacerbate it, make things worse. So, so management. This is why we have a social worker who is also a therapist to help patients with this, to help family members with this. That's one thing I also want to point out that's very uh, important is not only is the person with the disease process our patient, but the family is as well. They are as important to us as the patient is because you know what? They're going through that disease too. They're right along there with them. They're helping with their medicines. They're taking them to doctor's appointments. They're up with them at three in the morning when they're throwing up. You know, it's, it's, they're in that fight as well. They're down in the foxhole with them. So they are just as important. So we have therapists, we, you know, a lot of times we make referrals to psychiatrists in some cases, you know, somebody to talk to. It's so important to have that. We do sometimes use medications to address that. Sometimes they have difficulty sleeping because of the anxiety. Sometimes they're just having anxiety through the day. We can address it with medications. And we listen. And I, I think that's the biggest thing. When I'm sitting down with the patient, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example here. You go to a doctor's office, how long do they give you to sit down there with the doctor? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, usually it's pretty quick these days. And I, I, I you know, I, I know that's happening. We try to be a little different with our patients. When we have a new patient, we're spending an hour with them in our clinic. We sit down with them for an hour. New follow-up, some we've seen before, we spend at least 30 minutes with them, sometimes more. We have, it's that time to sit down and listen and what's, what's going on because we want to be part of their life. I tell people when I first meet them, I said, you know, we're on a journey together. We're going down a road together. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And there's gonna be a lot of thing, you know, a lot of curves in the road, ups and downs, there's gonna be some rocks, you know, but we're gonna stay with you on that road. We're gonna be with you and it's, it's a long road and it's gonna be a hard road, but we, you know, we're gonna be part of it. And that is, part of that is listening to what they're doing. Spiritual, okay. Regardless of your belief or non-belief, there's an existential part of you that is affected by this. What happened in my life, this is a question I've been asked, what did I do to deserve this? Why is this happening to me? Did I do something? It was because I did this, this, and this in my life. I don't understand, I've been a good person. You know, these, these are many of the questions that get asked, not necessarily you know, to me, but they're asking themselves this. And, you know, and, they, and they, it's, it's a part of this journey that they're on to have that address. And it's, it's one of those things that I think gets looked over a lot of times. But, you know, when I sit down and talk to people, whether they believe in a God, there's people out there that are very spiritual about going in the mountains, go fishing. I had a guy that was huge on baseball. That was his church. He loved to go to the baseball games. And that was important to him. Whatever that might be, whatever your spirituality, it, we need to talk about that. We need to see how that's affecting you. We have people on our team, chaplains, that work at the cancer center, but also at the hospital, that focus on that spiritual aspect of it. We have one that we work with a lot. Her name is Rainey Larson. She's a chaplain. And what's kind of neat about Rainey is she went to, of course, theology. She's, you know, she has a degree in theology, but she's also had specialized training in working with patients with disease, with cancer. And that's what's really, really special about her. She gets it. She understands, she knows how to talk to people, and they all, all of our chaplains really do, but she has a special bond with the, a lot of these patients with cancer, and so we enroll her or enlist her a lot of times along with other chaplains because we know we're not gonna, we can't address every single problem we, we try to, but we know that, again, it takes a village of people, it takes a lot of people to try and, and help out. So we have those, we also have therapists. And the spiritual distress can manifest itself as physical or emotional symptoms and reduce the quality of life. Sometimes it's a vicious cycle. You get anxiety, 
Anxiety can cause you to feel distressed, short of breath, and it just goes on and on. It can go in a wild circle. So when we're addressing someone that has shortness of breath or pain, we try to get to the bottom of it. Tell me about this pain. What is, what's going on? Tell me what brought it on. And, you know, doing a, spending time with them, listening, understanding what's bringing this on will help us address that because many times we're finally addressing the what's really getting, what's really getting them, what's at the bottom of all this is a lot of times the cure. It's not a pill. You know, we can give them pills to try and bring it down, but, you know, I've seen it. We, we have on so many medications, they're just sleepy, but they're still hurting. Why are they still hurting? So getting to the bottom of that is really, really important. Social distress. Now, that sounds kind of weird. I know, like social distress, but many times people that have a long-term illness don't have much of a support system. How are they going to get to their doctor's appointments? You know, they, need, they have mobility problems. How are they going to get up in their house? There's no, there's no ramp. What about insurance? I can't work. How am I going to pay for my bills? How am I going to feed my family? This all kind of comes under this heading of social distress. How are they going to get there? Financial. You know, be honest, medical care is expensive these days. It's not cheap. We don't live in a uh, country that it's free. You know, we have to pay out of pocket for that or, you know, pay for our expenses. You know, we have Medicare, which is helpful. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's done a lot. But there's other things that Medicare doesn't pay for. And unfortunately, you know, some of the treatments are a part of that. So that's going to be very distressing for people. Can they work? Can they support their family? Do they have insurance? All questions. Medical equipment, transportation. These are all things that we try to address as well. We work with nurse navigators that are at these different facilities, social workers in the hospital that also ask these questions. So as you can see, when we talk to somebody, it's not just about a little symptom. We're trying to, we're getting a big global picture of what's going on with them. And they, many times when we address all these little things, the little, you know, what you and I might think is a very small thing can be just like a tidal wave to somebody. You know, it's just, it's, it's so huge. And we've seen that so many times. And if we figure out a plan, they're like, that's all it took? <sighs> you know, they, they're just, they're just, they lay back and they're just relaxed. So, okay. So here's some of the things that people tell me, and we're kind of getting to a new topic here, but that, that is about the symptom management portion of it, okay? I, want, I am treated with dignity and respect. I was diagnosed early. So I want to die well. I can enjoy life. I feel part of a community and I'm inspired to give something back. I know what I can do to help myself and who else can help me. These are all things that people say and do when they're talking about the end of life here. I get the treatment and care which are best for my cancer in my life. Those around me are well supported. It's not just about the disease, it's not just about the symptoms, it's about support, it's about how they feel. I can enjoy life. Big things here. Okay, so, confusing in terms. There's a lot, I said, this is part of the lecture that or talk I wanna tell you about the different terms and what they mean. So sometimes terms used to describe pain and symptom management and end of life care are used interchangeably. So they actually mean different things, okay? So this is where we talk about that. So, here are the terms I want to talk to you about today. First, there's palliative care. Then we talk about end-of-life care. And then hospice care. Some of them integrate together. Some of them are very separate things. So first, let's talk about palliative care. This is what I do. I am a palliative care nurse practitioner. Focuses on symptom management at an advanced stage of a disease process, including, but not limited to, the final days of life. I've had patients on my service that I have known from day one when I started, and they're still seeing me in clinic and we're going along just fine. So it's a long term, you know, they're not actively dying. But they do have a life limiting disease process, and we're just managing them and helping them live life. Chronic terminal diseases does not ask for life prolonging interventions to be stopped. So they want to get chemo, or they want to get radiation, or they want to continue receiving hemodialysis or receiving medications for their heart failure. They're not asking for anything to be stopped. They just want to live their life and be, have quality life. So aggressive treatments may continue. So palliative care, focus on the symptom management portion of it, but we also want to make sure that we're giving them quality of life and what they're doing. End of life care. This is reserved for patients that are not responding to medical treatments. So they're receiving a certain treatment for their heart failure or chemotherapy for their cancer, but the disease is progressing, it's getting worse, and not improving. 
But at that point, we want to focus on their comfort with pain and symptom management. We don't attempt to reverse the dying process. Patient or family may elect to enroll in hospice. And so this is where we kind of would roll in hospice. Do you have to receive hospice if you're dying? No, you do not. Hospice is an option for you, and I'm going to talk to you about what hospice means, but this is what end-of-life care is. We're not going to try and reverse the process. We're going to focus on making sure you have a quality end of your life, the smooth landing that I was telling you about, and you can enroll into hospice. Now, what is hospice? Here's hospice, okay? So hospice is reserved for those that have a terminal diagnosis. Everybody hears that word terminal, okay? Six months or less to live. Now, does anybody really and truly know how much longer you have lived? No. Doctors, healthcare providers, researchers have done their darndest to try. And you know what it's, you know, what, you know how accurate they are? They're not. And that's the honest to goodness truth. If, you, if I were to put a big wall up, or a big piece of paper up there and I shoot a shotgun and it scatters, that's how accurate people are. It's not accurate. What we can do is is we can make uh, estimations based on patients with similar processes that how long they have done. So we, when somebody asks me that, we talk about giving ranges like hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years, things like that. Those are good estimations. Now, are we right? People fool me all the time. All the time. I just, I, it just, it, it, it bought, so Nancy, my boss, she, or my clinical liaison, I'm sorry, um, she is the ICU director at Catholic. Patients roll through there all the time, very sick, very illness. How many times have you guys been fooled? Every day. Every single day. Okay? So the point is, this six months, what it is, there are criteria that Medicare, CMS, gives us that people will qualify under hospice for. And based on those, those are an estimated six months. Okay, so when I, everybody gets focused on the six months, and I want to clarify what that means. It's an estimation that they've seen with other patients. So, for example, uh, people that have cancer, when do you qualify for hospice? Well, when they've determined that it's, there's different stages, like stage four, which means it's spread beyond the regular, original site of the cancer. They have shown that chemotherapy has not been effective or they have chosen not to receive chemotherapy and there's certain uh, quality of life that they're having or uh, performance factors. They would qualify for hospice. How do they know that? Well, they don't know it's six months, but they know that that is where they can focus on comfort and end of care and life. And there's criteria for everything, heart failure, dementia, ALS, multiple sclerosis, you name it. They have them all kind of designated there. So. If we encounter a patient in the hospital, we would assess them. And if we think they would meet quality criteria for hospice and they're interested in hospice, then we would make referral to the hospice agency. And I'll kind of get in that in a little bit more here. But that's what this means. Six months or less to live, that's when we start thinking about hospice. Hospice focuses on providing quality of life for patients and families, very big, as death approaches. Okay, And I, I, I've heard this term several times from from family members, I said, what is, because I asked that question. The first time I ever started talking about hospice, I said, what does hospice mean to you? And they say, you're putting me out to pasture. <laughs> it's like, well, I said, that's one way I guess to put it. <laughs> but, and it's actually not. In fact, you're, you're stop. another one I've heard is, you're going to stop taking care of me. And that is the very 180 degree polar opposite of what happens. In fact, if anything, hospice adds a layer of care. You're getting more care with hospice, more intense care. What you're doing is, when you're at the point now where you're over here focusing on taking care of the disease process, you're focused on that, you're putting all your energy and efforts towards that. When you decide at that point, I'm not gonna pursue any further aggressive management, I'm not interested in receiving chemotherapy, radiation, what have you, I just wanna be comfortable for whatever time is remaining. Then you shift that focus and all that effort and all of that uh, intensity into symptom and uh, symptom management and pain management and so forth. That's all it is. That is the big difference. That is the huge thing I just like to get across people and put it very simply. It's a focus shift. And that's what it boils down to. So, who, and, and Medicare, they're the ones that kind of make rules for, or, for hospice. 
they have certain guidelines that have to be followed by every hospice agency despite what state it's in, despite how big the agency is, despite how small. They all have to have physicians, medical director, nursing staff, case managers, chaplains. They also provide all medical equipment, where it be a potty chair, a bed, wheelchair, canes, all provided. All the medications are provided. All of this is, if you have Medicare, is covered under the Medicare benefit. If you don't have Medicare and you have insurance, most insurances cover it at near or close to, or at 100%. You know, there, every insurance is different. Don't quote me on which ones do what, but it's a covered, uh, you know, um, service. It relies on family members to be primary caregivers and set in facilities such as nursing homes. Now, does hospice come in there and have 24-hour support? No. That's not their, they don't have nurses' aides in there every day. The nurses aren't taking care of them 24-7. What they do provide is 24-hour a day, seven days a week, crisis nursing management. So if that person is at home and they start having pain at 3 in the morning, you can call hospice up and the nurse will come out there and take care of them. That's what they do. They provide that type of, they will come see them during the day. How are you doing? They adjust the medicines. They make sure you have all the equipment you need. They also provide bereavement and grief support to the patients and the family members. Yes, so the question was, is hospice care available at home or do you have to go to a facility? So one thing I wanna say about this, hospice is a type of care. It's not a place, it's not a location. Hospice can be applied, yes, in your home, at home care, but there's also some agencies that do operate a inpatient hospice unit, and there's actually one here in town called uh, Chaplaincy, and they have a hospice house. And it's a, uh, it's a small facility, it's over in Kennewick off of 395 in Yelm. And they have 24 hour a day, seven days a week, nursing and care staff support. And what it is, it's for those patients that are having intensive, oops, intensive symptom management needs. They need continuous symptom management. Whereas people that don't need the symptom management all the time, they can you know, very well go, undergo hospice at home. So. That uh, essentially, yes, you can do that in home. Uh, no, no, that's no problem, no. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, so one thing, that, this is a, a good quote that I, I found, and I'd like to share this with you guys in talking about this. So, dealing with a serious illness can be a lonely and difficult experience for individuals and their families. They need to know that they aren't alone. And that's one of the big things that chaplaincy even says, that, you know, that you're not alone. You're, you're never, you'll never walk alone. And that's the truth. You know, they feel like, well, I'm in hospice now, then I'm on my own, that's it. No, that is very much not the case. They are there with you. They're there with your family. And in fact, one other benefit that hospice provides, that is mandated by Medicare, is bereavement support, grief support, for one year after that death, the death of the hospice uh, enrollee. And that's for the family to participate in. One year after. That's how long the Medicare benefit, or the uh, hospice benefit lasts. That's what included, it's, it's huge. And there's a lot of disparities, a lot of things that prevent people from going into hospice. A lot of times it's education. And this is why I like to talk about this because I'm not trying to talk into going to hospice, but you should know it's there. For if you do, if you ever encounter the need or for you or a family member that needs hospice, it's there. And you know, it's a wonderful service. Has anybody ever worked with hospice or a family member in hospice? There's a few people in here. And I personally, on a personal level, I've had two family members that were enrolled in hospice and they were had day of cancer. And, I, and it was in Texas, that's where I'm from originally. Um, wonderful. I've been in Washington State for 10 years and the organizations in this area are wonderful. You know, hospice is a wonderful, wonderful thing that Dame Cicely Saunders got going. And I, I really hate to see a world without that I really would hate to see that. It would be a very sad world indeed. So let's talk about advanced care planning. So this is the other part of the subject that I want to talk to you about today. I want to tell you about hospice. I want to tell you about palliative care. I want to tell you about end of life care, symptoms, what we do at the hospital. But as equal importance and very important is what I call, what we call advanced care planning. As I said before, how many of us are gonna die, okay? Are you prepared to die? And that's a question, it's a rhetorical question. Are you ready to die? Are you 
does your family know your wishes? And that is very, very important. And I, I want to talk about this for a bit because the most, the, the, the most stressful time, the worst times I have seen with families in the hospital are people that don't know what their family members want. They're in the ICU, they're on a ventilator, they can't talk. And families are, you know, where they're wringing their hands, they're, you know, you can tell they're very obviously distraught. And you ask them, well, what's going on? I said, I, I, I don't know what they want me to do. I feel like I have their life in my hands. And if I, if I say, you know, turn the ventilator off and they die, I mean, is, am I killing them? Am I murdering them? I mean, do we keep going? And it's, it's just, few, you know, it's just all these things are racing into their mind. Whereas patients, families that I see that have talked to them, they know. They say, you know, this is a horrible time. I'm, you know, obviously very upset, sad, but I know this is what they would want. And even though I'm just going to be sad to lose them, they'll be gone from my life, but I know when I lay my head down at night on the pillow, I'm honoring their wishes, and I know what they want. And that's very peaceful for them. And that is important because I, I, I love my family very members very much, and I would hate to, for them to have to go through that. Plus, beyond that is I want to make sure that my wishes are being honored. I want to, I want to make sure that what's happening to me, my body, is what I want, you know, it's, 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 it's a, you know, I, do I want to go through all this? No, probably, you know, depending on the situation, I don't know. But I've outlined that, and I think it's important for all of you, to anybody. In fact, there's a push in the state now to start with people starting to drive, 16 years old. Because do we know when we're going to die, like I said before? No. It can happen at any moment. And they want to start getting that word, that message out there. It's not to be morbid. It's not to sit there and pray, oh, dying, dying. It's not about that. It's about making sure we're honoring people's wishes and getting the message out there. So that's why advanced care planning is so big. Making decisions about the care you would want to receive if you become unable to speak for yourself. You're not able to communicate your wishes. That's what it's about. Decisions you make, regardless of what you choose for care, the decisions based on you. Your personal values, what you want, may be different than what I want. And I'm not about to impose my values, my beliefs on you, because I, I, I don't know what you would want. And I would never assume that. But if you have it on a piece of paper, I know this is what they're going to do, and this is what I'm going to do to honor it, and I'm going to fight tooth and nail for you to honor your wishes. If you're in an accident or have an illness that leaves you unable to talk, who will speak for you? So you can't speak... You haven't filled out a paper, so who's going to be speaking for you? Is it your husband, your wife, your spouse, brother, loved one, child? You know, who, who's it going to be? Who do you want it to be? You know, not every family gets along. And in fact, I was telling my, uh, my clinical liaison about this, and I am in right in the middle of this situation right now at the hospital. In fact, I was working with it right before I came over here. There's a group of family members that aren't seeing eye to eye with the patient's care. One wants this, and one wants this. And they're siblings. And you, you think, oh, this wouldn't happen to me. No, it happens. It happens more than you think. It, in fact, on, on a personal note, it's happened in my family. I never thought it. It's, it, it was like, I'm really, I, I'm, I can talk about this now. <laughs> I have personal knowledge. It's happened. So to say that, it's, it's you know, it's, it, I wouldn't, I don't think people should say that until they really think, really, you know, they're hardcore, then they know that, but it's, uh, it happens more often than not. So assuring, and that's what's actually, in this situation I was telling you about the hospital, this is what has solidified the decision is she completed an advanced directive and said, I want this person to make decisions for me, and it's a done deal. Now, one party's not very happy about that, but... I know that the focus of this person's care is on the patient. It's not about what this person wants or this person wants. It's about what the patient wanted. Because this patient cannot speak for themselves right now. So we're in a situation of, well, what do we do? We got one telling us this one. Do we have an advanced directive? That's the first question I asked. Do we have an advanced directive? And does it list a medical proxy or a power of attorney? End of story. Right there. So making the decision about who will speak for you is as important as filling out the document 
Okay, so moving on. Getting information about the tip, so advanced care planning, what does it include? Let me see, make sure I can see, yes. Getting information about the types of life-sustaining treatments that are available. Deciding what types of treatment you would or would not want should you be diagnosed with a life-limiting illness or be in an accident or have some kind of un unknown you know, event happen where you can't talk. Sharing your own personal values with your loved ones. Completing advanced directives and putting into writing what types of treatment you would or would not want. Should you be able to speak for yourselves? Okay, so what's an advanced directive? What does that mean? Well, there's two words, living will, advanced directive allows you to document your wishes concerning your medical treatments at the end of life. You're telling your health care provider, the provider's taking care of you, this is what I want. A medical power of attorney, what does that mean? Health care proxy, that's the person that you have designated to be your voice, to speak for you. Okay, advanced directives. Legally valid throughout the United States. So if you fill out an advanced directive in Washington, it's valid in Maryland, it's valid in Hawaii across the United States. Uh, while you do not need an order to fill out an advanced directive, you don't need, it does not need to be completed by an attorney. It doesn't need to be witnessed by a notary, you know, and so forth. There are certain rules about who needs to see it, but you do not need to get this filled out through an attorney. It's not legal advice, I'm just telling you this, it's just not a requirement. Uh, uh, also, advanced directives have different titles in different states. So, you know, here it's an advanced directive. They also call it living will here in Washington. Now. What if my heart stops? Because this is part of advanced care planning, is if something catastrophic were to happen to you, what if your heart were to stop? What would you want? How would you want your healthcare team to treat you? So, resuscitation takes place. It's a big word, resuscitation. What does that mean? That means everybody jumps in and starts working on you to get your heartbeat restored. So, a resuscitation temp is an organized effort to restore a person's heartbeat. CPR, we've all heard CPR, right? CPR can be provided by people like yourself, lay people, as well as qualified medical personnel. So, resuscitative measures include the CPR, or chest compressions, defibrillation. You ever seen them take, put the paddles on their chest and they, they jump six feet in the air? Yeah, so that's part of it too. That doesn't really happen, by the way. Emergency medications. That means they give special medicines to try and get the heart started. Advanced procedures to save your life, like they put special IVs in your neck to go into the big veins, IVs in your bone. There's different things that they can do to help restore your heartbeat. There's a lot of things, a lot of things they can do. So, brings me to the point of a DNR. Who's heard the word DNR before? Pretty much, you know, there's quite a few people. What does that mean? That means do not resuscitate. That means I do not want any aggressive measures performed to try and restore my heartbeat. Uh, it allows for a natural death. There's nothing wrong. It's not like they're giving up. It's your choice. It's your decision. CPR can be a very traumatic event. You know, when they do compressions, it can cause bones to break. It can cause bones to be separated. It happens. It can do that. But if that's what you want, I can guarantee you everybody in the healthcare field will do their very best to restore your heartbeat and do that. Yes, sir. So the question is, is if you're out in an accident, your heart stopped beating, and you do not have your DNR on you, what would they do? And the, the rule is they always defer back to they want everything done. And they would perform CPR, but if they were continuing to do CPR and they found out you did, they would stop. They would stop at that point. But in the absence of knowledge, healthcare providers have to go with trying to save your life. Yes? What if I stop breathing? Your heart's still going, but I'm not breathing. What do we do? Well, they can do rescue breathing, mouth to mouth, bag valve mask, they put a mask on you and they breathe for you. Advanced airway procedures, well, that's things like they have to, can put a tube in your mouth and cook it to a ventilator to breathe for you, the machine, you know. Um, DNI, that's another option. Do not intubate. That means do not put a tube in my throat and put me to a ventilator. They're, now, does that mean they're just going to let you sit there and die? They can support you in other ways if you do want that. They have non-invasive, non-ways. They have masks they can put on you to help kind of support your breathing. They have oxygen, things like that. But they're not going to allow you to suffer. You know, people say that, well, you're not going to do anything. What are you going to do for me? 
they will support you and make sure you're comfortable because we have ways of making people comfortable despite not doing anything aggressive or invasive. So it's not like we're not going to care for you. People will be cared for, just not going the advanced or aggressive route. Decisions about end-of-life care are deeply personal. Each person has an own idea, feelings, values that need to be addressed. Because it is impossible to foresee every type of circumstance or illness, it is essential to think about what's important to you. Conversations that focus on your wishes and beliefs will relieve loved ones and healthcare providers of the need to guess what you want. So the last thing I'll leave you with here is death is a be beautiful when seen by to be a law and is not an accident. It was as common as life. Dr. David, Henry David Thoreau wrote that. And it is. Death is a part of life. And it's the very truth, and we're not going to escape that fact. But how you go out of this world, how you want the end, the end of your life to be is up to you, and you can tailor to your wishes and your needs. And that is a possibility, and that is very, not a possibility, that is doable. We can do that for you, and I want you guys to know that, that it doesn't have to be something that you're not like, gosh, I've heard people say, at the end of, I, don't, I would never want to do that. You don't have to. You can spell this out, and it's important. So today, some of you have already picked them up, but if you haven't, please do. I have provided a document, and it has instructions on there. It's the Washington State Advanced Directive. And it goes through everything, and then you can do it's self, pretty self explanatory. There's numbers in there if you can call if you have any questions. But at least, at the very minimum, take this home and talk to your family members about what you want. At the very minimum, even if you don't fill this out, which I wish you would, but <laughs> if you don't fill this out, at least tell people hey, you know what? Let's sit down and talk about at the end of life. I think it's a big conversation you should have with your family because, like I said, it's going to relieve a lot of stress, a lot of burden. And talk to your, you know, it goes back and forth. You know, people say, well, they're only 18. They don't need to worry about that. Talk to them. What would you want? Because it, things happen, and it's very possible. So that is all I have. Do you have any questions? Uh, there are a few people ask questions, but I'm open for questions if you guys have any. Yes. Oh, good question. So the question is, to enroll in hospice, do you have to be bedridden? Absolutely not. That's, you do not have to be bedridden. Uh, if you are bedridden, they will, you know, take care of you, make sure you're cared for. Uh, there's people that are in hospice that I've known to be in hospice for years, and they actually get around, they go to the grocery store. They still live life, and that's the big thing. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. E I, excellent question. So she was asking, there are some hospices out in the, out in the community, out in the, probably the United States, that provide very poor care. And unfortunately, not every hospice is e not all hospices are equal. Uh, I've heard of hospice agencies that... Uh, operate on a shoestring budget. Some have millions to work with. There's very different, you know, donation levels because many of them operate off of, you know, funds from Medicare, but they also get donations so they can provide more services. Some can't provide as many services. And unfortunately, it's kind of like any other kind of care business that, you know, sometimes the folks there won't provide as good quality care. So how do I know? Talk to them. Are they willing to allow you to come in there and, and ask questions? How open are they? You know, things like that. You know, I would say go and visit them. Go, if, like, say, chaplaincy, for example. Say, I want to come see your hospice house, and I want to hear about what you can offer me. And they will be the first one to say, come on in. You don't have to announce that you're coming. You can just show up. They like questions. They want to teach you about that. Yes, sir. Good question. Once you fill it out, what do I do with it? That's where they send everybody. Yeah, right, exactly. What do I do with the advanced directive once I've completed it? Okay, so if you want to bring it to Cadillac, I would say bring it to our medical records department. And what they would do is they would scan it into our electronic medical record. When I go into a patient's chart, I know exactly where they scan it into and I look for it. And so they, and they designate it in the computer system, advanced directive. So for Cadillac, I would do that. But what I would recommend you guys do, once you complete it, get it notarized, do all the qualifications, make a copy of it. Give it to your health care provider. Give a copy to your children, your loved ones, your medical proxy. Give out a bunch of copies to the people that you think would need to understand this. And then put a copy in a safe place where it can't be destroyed. Once you pass all those out, because uh, many times I've had people come in and say, oh, they gave me a copy, it's at home, and they will bring it up, and then we have it. 
Anybody you think would need a copy of it to know what your wishes are, give them a copy. But keep the original in a safe place. But yes, your doctor, loved ones, family, so forth. I, I've heard, that, yes, you know, I, so I worked on an ambulance for many years. And they always say, that, put it on the fridge. And you're absolutely right. I didn't go look at the fridge. You know, it's, it's, it's the truth. So where do you keep it in your house? That's an excellent question. Some place that you know to think to grab it. I, and it may be the fridge for you guys. It may be your bedside table. I don't know exactly where it was important to you. But somewhere where you know you can get to it easily and access it. That's the thing. And like I said, make sure loved ones, family, doctors have it. Yes? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, and I think that's true. There's a lot of fire departments out there that are trained to go look. And that may be a training aspect to individual departments. They know, oh, hey, I've got to go see if they're having this. So maybe that's something in their training that they know to go check. But thank you for doing that. So uh, wherever you guys live, ask, call the fire department and ask them, do they have that? And say, where would be the best place for us to put this? And ask department specific. And then you would know. That's a good Thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Are you talking about physician-assisted suicide? Yes. Okay. So we at Cadillac or Providence, we don't provide that. But there are resources out there. And the resource, and I didn't put this in there, but I'll, I can give it to you. I believe the website, if you have, do you have internet access? Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. Endoflifewa.com. And there are resources there for those that wish to look at or learn more about physician-assisted suicide. Is it legal in the state of Washington? Yes, it is. There is a long process that's involved in this. Uh, I'm not real savvy with it, but what I do know, it's, it's usually a several month process that you would need to go through to uh, undergo that process. So they, uh, they have, there's an 800 number you can call, you can talk to an individual, and they can kind of tell you what you need to do and what's involved with the program. I'm sorry if I don't have much information about that other than that website and that information. But endoflifewa.com. But one thing, you know, I ask people this when they bring up, uh, you know, this, which, I, like I said, I'm not gonna, I don't try to talk people out of it or anything. But what I do like to ask is what brings them to that point in their life where they say, you know what, I would like to do this. Is it something they're concerned about? With, what is their fear? Are they worried about having pain at the end of life? Do they want to be in control and just make the decision? Of when to, you know, those are the things that I, you know, think about when I, and someone brings up physician-assisted suicide. My situation is I do not want to go to a nursing home. I understand that. Either, either, either. Uh, you you want to you want to. Okay, yeah, and that's the thing. So, folks like yourself, this is where palliative care would be very helpful to you because controlling your pain and giving you a quality of life at the end is the ultimate goal. And I think at that point, you know, if you ever needed palliative care services, you can contact us and we can help out with that. So I want you to keep that in mind. You know what we can do. But to get that resource, if that's something you're interested in hearing about, that's endoflifewa.com. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? So coverage is for palliative care. Yes, I believe that Medicare does cover it. To what extent, I do not know what insurance companies, but yes, I know palliative care services are covered under the Medicare benefit to what, but the percentages, I don't know, have that. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So the question is, what happens if you live in Kennewick and you want to come to Cadillac? Um, yeah, if it's an emergency. So it really depends on what the emergency is. If you are having what they consider a heart attack, state law says that you have to go to the closest facility that can provide the care. If you, say, have pneumonia or up, uh, is that better? Oh, let's get away from the speaker. Better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have something like pneumonia, you can request with the ambulance crew that you come to Cadillac or to Lourdes or to, you know, Trios, any of the three. But if it's something like a heart attack, they will take you wherever's closest. Okay. I, I want to make one more plug here before we go. Please, please, please talk to your families about what your wishes are. I run our two intensive care units and every single day we have people 
who are having children or siblings or spouses who argue about what that patient wants. Sometimes to the point where we really think that we are torturing the patient. And if the patient has made their wishes known, we are gonna follow those wishes. If you leave it to your children, hoping that they will do what you want, it does not happen. So kids who have not gotten along for 50 years are not going to get along over the bed of you. I hate to say that, but the same with siblings. Please, please give them the grace of knowing what it is that you want. It makes a huge difference. And, and, and if, there's a, if there's a take home message today, talk. Talk to your family. It's a hard conversation sometimes, and you know, bringing that up, because you know, even though I say it used to be really taboo, it still is. There's still a lot of discomfort talking about dying, but I want you to know that beyond that discomfort, there will be a sense of relief for your family knowing what you want. So, you know, make sure that you do at least you know, make a point. Go home today and call, call up your family and say, hey, this is what I want if I were to die today. So on that note, really quick, I want to jump on your conversations that you're going to have over the holidays with your family. And yes, talking about death is not always comfortable, but the way you phrase it, how do you want to live, may be another way to go about doing it. So um, thank you so much. Great information, my goodness. Um, I will not be seeing you next month because we have our big holiday party, so I hope I see you there. Otherwise, I will look forward to seeing you in 2018. But have a happy holiday. <laughs>